craft, a word with many meanings, but one of them stands out. Witchcraft. Would you admit being a witch? Janet Ferrer does. Not only does she admit to be a witch, but she writes books about it, leads people, and you were in Amsterdam teaching people about witchcraft. I hope not just teaching, but working with the people of Amsterdam, because witchcraft has been here amongst you for a long, long time. It is possible that the origins of modern witchcraft actually comes out of the Netherlands. It's a history that goes back many hundreds of years to your pre-Christian ancestors. Before the birth of modern witchcraft, throughout the tiny hamlets of this country, from Friesland to the north of Holland, all the way down through every village, there were men and women who followed a very ancient deity and that ancient deity is the deity your country is named after. In Friesland, she is Freya. Her name means just the lady. Here she is Hela. She was the lady of the underworld. In your book, Which is Bible Complete, which you wrote with your husband, Stuart? That's right. Yes, you write, magic without love is black magic. Magic without love and black magic. Black magic is something that has never been part of witchcraft. The uh, truth. How come we think about it? Magic, magician, witches, black, dangerous. Immediately we feel the idea that, that it's black magic. Because you don't understand what is in all of you as human beings. As human beings, the, the key to magic is that magic is like electricity. It is how you use it. You can plug in something useful as an electric iron or something destructive as an electric chair. The magic of the universe is all around us, my love. It's everywhere that you look and you breathe. When you plug into magic, it is your personal responsibility that yeah, decides how it's used. From what I see there, I, I, when you say electricity, it sounds like love. Some people say there's a universal love around us. We just have to plug into it to experience it and do wonderful things. Well, I used to be a 60s hippie. I still believe in universal love. Um, universal love, it doesn't matter whether you label it as a religion or as a philosophy, just as an everyday way of life. It's learning to relate to the, the person beside you on the train, on the, the tram car, in the street. You don't have to necessarily like them or know them very well, but you learn to respect them as human beings. There's a huge global village at the moment. We are all part of that global village. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot know everybody in the human race but we allow them their own space, and that space is where magic happens. The magic oh, wait a moment, you, now you say that magic is like a relational <clears throat> thing. Today, when you did your ritual, you said we have to form a circle, with, and within the circle we have to have perfect love and perfect, perfect trust. trust. Okay, that, that I caught my eye, I thought, hey, that's nice. Um, you, you're making a mini world where that situation, where we all, what we all see. That mini world, if you get people together who are willing to work in harmony together, expands to the greater world. Um, witches believe that the planet Earth is our mother. And that mother has to be respected, cared for, and looked after. And that means that if you are here in the Netherlands and there is somebody in Australia, you are part of planet Earth. If the person from Australia comes to the Netherlands and befriends you, you respect his way of life, his customs, his traditions. He learns to respect yours. You learn backwards and forwards from each other all the time. If you share ritual space, and ritual space is what magic is about, ritual is when you take yourselves as human beings, put yourself into a sacred uh, space, which in witchcraft is known as, as a magic circle. It's the sphere of Mother Earth. That in that space, you share your humanity with each other. Black magic is where you do not share your humanity. Yes, but True why magic does it is work then? Humanity. Why does it work? Uh, I think it was Rupert Sheldrake who said that rituals are based on the fact that there's a certain repetition <coughs> and that the energy around is, is used to that. It recognizes the form of the ritual 
and gives it therefore a certain power. Now that's a theoretical model about what you do. But how, how does it relate to how you feel about it? On a deep subconscious level, a very deep subconscious level, the entire human race speaks in symbols. Not in words, not in spoken language, but in symbols. Those symbols are shared by every single person on this planet. They are sometimes almost intangible. But our deep subconscious Is this what, what Jung would call the archetype? The collective unconscious, the archetypes. Jung is very highly respected amongst the witches because for his period of history, he was advanced in his mental way of thinking. Thinking has advanced even more since the days of Jung. But when Jung talked about the collective unconscious, he talked of this archetypal, of archetypal symbolism that interlinked, that joined all humanity together. When you work in a ritual space, we touch each other's archetypes. And those archetypes speak to each other. It doesn't matter your skin color, the background you grew up in. It's okay, there. It's yeah, a deep link. So Jung would say archetypes. I'm a physicist, and this feels like you say, hey, we have the same frequency. And if two objects have the same frequency, something called oscillation happens, and we both feel, hey, it's that's happening. That's right. And there's Which magic. Is, but that, yeah, but that's, you could call it magic. Um, magic and science are interlinked. We once did a survey for one of our books, and we sent out a questionnaire across the world, and we discovered two interesting things. The majority of witches fell into two categories. Nurses in the medical profession and doctors and paramedics, and scientists and computer programmers um, and all the other fields of computers that work. There was this nice mixture of um, the sympathetic healing, working with the sick, and working with the linear logical mind in the field of computers and science. Yeah, but is that because we, as scientists, I work with computers, are we overcompensating? Are we you know, we, we need a soft spot, so we look at this vaguely vague stuff which rituals and, and witchcraft and new age thinking. I, I don't necessarily think so. It can be sometimes, but not all the time. Um, I tend to be a bit skeptical of the quote unquote new age. Uh, let us use an example. People who work with crystals, and they say that if we lay all these crystals here, there, and everywhere on your body, that you'll be healed. Um, there is no doubt there is a resonance between crystals. But that does not necessarily mean that that resonance works with a patient, or as a client, as we prefer to call them. Um, you remember, I'm sure you've had it here, if you had rheumatism, putting a copper bracelet on your arm would mm -hmm. help. Copper, yes, ingested copper does seem to help rheumatism. But I think there are too many people who are quacks. Uh, they're, they're, they're freaks, they're flakes. That's a lovely expression, a flake. They are people who want to feel that they can do something positive. A lot of healing is psychological. It takes place in the subconscious mind. Yeah, but isn't then it true that whatever the quack believes and his client believes, it works? That depends on what you're dealing with. Not necessarily all cancers can be cured by an interplay of minds. Sometimes the surgeon's knife is needed. The difference between a witch and a New Age pagan, not all New Age pagans, again, I do not want to feel that there are pagans out there or New Age people who feel that I'm insulting them, is where the doctor, I use that word very lightly, and their client, their patient, are so interlinked with each other that the harmony between them takes place on many levels. I prefer my doctor, mm -hmm to have a working knowledge of medical science. To know when to say, I can't help you, you need this person, or this person, or this person. Whether it is the medical profession as we know it, whether it is somebody who is a chiropractor, a homeopath, an osteopath, a reflexologist, etc. It is good for any witch to have a general knowledge of these fields, work in these fields, and know when to say, I cannot help you. Um, my own particular field, in my coven I have a registered nurse, a male registered nurse who specialized in renal medicine. Um, he worked a lot on dialysis. 
in the hospital in England where he worked, he had to teach young doctors how to use dialysis machines. They were not trained. Um, as a psychic and as a witch, he was very empathic with his patients. So his medical training and his spiritual experience worked like that together. I trained as a psychologist with a, an elderly woman. Well, she's elderly now. She was middle-aged when I knew her. Her earliest memories were being bounced up and down on Sigmund Freud's knee. Um, she had grown up with the Freuds and the Jungs as family friends. Um, she did not follow Freud. She became qualified as a psychiatrist. Um, she is now, she prefers to be called a Jungian psychologist. Um, her field of working was totally in psychology and she trained me. And in exchange, we had an interplay of, I taught her how to use her spirituality, mm -hmm. her psychic experiences. Um, she had worked totally most of her life as a psychologist and she would feel terribly drained. I introduced but her to the Hindu chakra system. Yeah, you, you give Keep a number of, of, of examples of people who, well, you, s you still talk about clients. There is a shamanistic way whereby actually the healer takes on the suffering of his patient, and, and this process is totally reversed. And in many other cultures, that yes. is a way yes. of healing. So when I think about witchcraft, so I still see that somewhere in between these two worlds. So is that something you take on? If you, it is if you, if you interact with someone, do you pick up their energy, take their suffering? Some, it depends again on the, the witch concern, the priest or priestess concerned. Um, just, just to make that clear, when you talk about priestesses, the people that you work with, people who are interested in, in witchcraft, they join the movement, the craft, whatever, there's many ways, they, f they, they become part of a coven, and you could then call them priest or priestess. After about a year of training, um, the, the law is physician heal thyself. So you start, when you join a group, of discover, a path of self-discovery. After a year, you become dedicated to learning your skills. And maybe five years later, you become a priest or priestess. It's usually about okay. five years. Come back. Not to with every coven, but this is the way we work. Um, you may find that inside that coven, if you have anything from six to about 12 to 13 people, 13 was the traditional number um, because of the 12 signs of the zodiac and also because of a balance of six men and six women and a woman who runs the coven. She is the mother figure. She sits there and becomes great mother. She looks after the interests of all of them. During that period, when a person has finally trained to become a priest or priestess, the ultimate aim is that they will work in one form or another with healing. Witchcraft is a healing philosophy. Religion, call it what you will. Some people are empathic and choose specifically to work as empaths. Now, if they do, they, witchcraft is a shamanistic religion. So empath, they you mean choose, you really take up the energy from the other person? You take it into yourself. Not every witch is capable of that. Um, if you have a witch who comes to you who's suffering from something like multiple cirrhosis, you cannot expect them to take the other person's suffering. They've got enough themselves. It doesn't mean to say they can't be a good counsellor and work with people as a counsellor, but they have to detach themselves and sit back mm -hmm. from their patient. But, but suppose Other someone does empathise, what, what happens? Like, what wh happens why, is is it, why does it work in the first place? Why, the reason it works is because you, the human being is made of many levels. The physical, the material body that we can touch, the spiritual body, which is the inner you. Then there is your ego, your ego. Um, that part of you that makes you dynamic. There is your subtle, fine, etheric body. Um, there is your astral body. Now, the astral body, many people hear the word astral traveling. Being able to leave your body without dying and travel to the spiritual realms. This is very fine, very flexible, very almost intangible. But your etheric body is like an energy field that surrounds you. It is so tangible that you can touch it. Um, oh. All you have to do is, that's it, 
you, you reach out to your hands. You, you, get you, outside the, feel, yeah. you get outside the heat field, which the human body projects, and there's almost a static electricity. Yes, well, it's a fine, so we, can, we can feel that. That's right, there's a fine static electricity. The etheric body often produces the beginnings of disease before it enters the physical body. Cancer is very easily detectable upon the etheric body. Um, to those that have spiritual vision, they often see it as almost like little black microbes twisting and turning. They're, they're, they're so tiny. They're, they're like pinpricks, little black, dirty, gray, green, black pinpricks. Um, and then, of course, it enters into the physical body and becomes a physical disease. With an empath, an empath will often take that before it's actually entered into you and then cleanse it away from themselves. Because inside they have another way of dealing with it? Are they able their, to deal with that energy? Their way of dealing with it is not to allow it to enter beyond the edge, the very edge of their etheric body. They allow it to touch them, but they get rid of it the moment it's entered. If it has already entered beyond the etheric body into the physical body, then in, not in every case. I would not give hope to millions by saying that witches can cure multitudes. We cannot. What we are capable of in some cases is to alter what is happening inside the physical organs. And it's almost like turning a cancer inside itself. That those cells, and remember that cancer is only born from healthy tissue. This is why the younger you are, the often the harder it is to cure a cancer. It's almost like turning those healthy cells in on themselves. In other mm -hmm. words, those overactive cells that mutate back on themselves so that they almost devour each other. Now, it's not always done empathically, spiritually. It can be done, a good herbalist can do this. We have a friend who lives in Ireland and he's a druid. He self-trained himself as a herbalist. And I'm very wary of people who self-train. They do not take a course. I prefer somebody to take a course on a subject. But he does know what he's doing. He's proved himself time and time again. Um, there was a young couple who had a little baby who, at about six months old, be, uh, was not able to express what he was feeling. But he would not stop crying. He was fretty. He suffered from high fevers constantly. Um, finally, the doctor sent the child to hospital for a, a CAT scan, a brain scan. And they discovered that the little boy had a growth on his brain. It was inoperable, and it was getting larger and larger. Um, the child had started off as a normal, healthy little baby, and the growth had been so rapid that instead of developing as the way a, a normal baby would, gradually he was losing the power of his hands, his vision was beginning to go. Um, he was in a terrible state, and the hospital told his parents the best thing would be to let him die, to take the child home mm -hmm. to die. They went to our druid um, because they knew he had a reputation. And they said, is there anything you can do? He uses a decoction of mistletoe. He told the parents, is the child on any medication? You must always ask this. Medication can clash. Um, the child was not on medication. And this to him was appalling in any case, because this little boy was in terrible pain. And he said, let's try to use the mistletoe. And he made a decoction of mistletoe, and he told the mother to feed it to the baby in the baby's milk. Um, he was to give a large spoonful, that we call a tablespoon, of this mistletoe con uh, concoction to the baby's milk every day. They were so desperate, they would try anything. They started every feed because he even lost the ability to take solid food into himself. He was back on a milk diet. Um, his mother's breasts had dried up. She was not able to breastfeed him. So she was using these tins of mother's, you know, mother's baby milk. The mistletoe went into the milk. And six weeks later, the little boy started to laugh. It was the first time he'd laughed in a long, long time. And they were delighted. Then he started to show interest, his, his vision. He was taking interest in things that moved, peripheral vision. It became stronger and stronger. 
12 weeks after the mistletoe had first been ingested by that child, he went back for a CAT scan. The growth was shrinking. He is now a happy five-year-old little boy running around completely normal. The growth has totally gone. And this was a child the doctors had given up hope on. Mm -hmm. Since then, of course, doctors have been talking about mistletoe as being useful for the treatment of certain, not all, but certain types of cancer. Mm -hmm. And it is very effective for cancers that grow on the brain. Um, the druid, before he used this, he tried it on himself because he had skin cancer. It was very effective on his skin cancer. He did all the research he could. And as he said to me, he said, with the case of this little boy, it was a last hope. And I may have been doing the wrong thing. I had to take a chance. So he took the chance. And hopefully, as he said, that little boy will grow up into a healthy young man and live to a ripe old mm -hmm. age. He has no guarantee that the cancer will not come back. It's five years on. He may well have to wait for another five years before, before he feels going. completely certain. Now, before you said that many people, they say in the medical profession, are drawn to witchcraft. Is it because of these kinds of miracles? I miracles to, in, in the medical world. But. I don't think so. I think it's because to be a witch, you have to care about humanity. That's one of the most important factors. I don't think that if you are a good doctor or a good nurse, you choose that profession unless you care about humanity. Yes, there are many people who are in it just for the money, oh, just wait, to wait, make wait money. Minute. Because here you kind of say uh, they care about the money. Uh, they, they care about people. Humanity. Humanity, people. but they do it in a specific way. They want actively to help people. That's right. Suffering because Ma maybe they were young or whatever. Other people, if you're in business, um, you might care about humanity in a different, on a different level, on a different, in a different direction. Someone who is a pilot, I don't know, might feel that he's helping humanity in his way. Well, one of our witches is a young businessman in Dublin. He um, hires out um, various pieces of equipment to the building industry. Um, in fact, he's just come back from Rotterdam. He's looking for, uh, we, I don't know what you would call it over here, but cherry pickers, the very high scaffolding equipment, etc. Um, he wanted to join the craft because one day, as he said, I would like to retire, not as somebody who hired out building equipment. I would like to open a healing center, mm -hmm. but I want to gain life experience before I do it. Um, in his spare time, he is a counsellor for Alcoholics Anonymous. Once a week, he does counselling services with prisons. But again, you describe someone who is, who is must, maybe at, at, at an early age was touched by noticeable suffering in other people. They become doctors. And I, th I think this is, this is one of the things, that it doesn't matter what your profession is, but for most witches, there is a healing aspect in their, in their life, in their philosophy. Um, so it does not matter if they're a bank manager or if they are a gardener or a building site laborer. They tend to be drawn to a philosophy that gives them a chance in one form or another to work in one field or another field of the humanities, mm -hmm. um, which they can incorporate into their work. Um, we had a, a witch many years ago who was a building site laborer. His job was putting up scaffolding, building railway stations, etc. Which has been He wanted to, to build yeah. the best and the safest and the most pleasant station. He would look at the architectural plans and he would incorporate on those plans a little touch of himself. And he said that when they come to my railway station, they have a place that they feel comfortable. And sometimes it was a spiritual thing. <coughs> um, he built railway stations in London. Now, there are parts of London that are very violent. There's a lot of drug problems, etc. As far as he was concerned, his railway stations, he would act as, if you like, a, a priest. And when he was laying the foundations, mixing the bricks and mortar, building that part of an underground railway system, he would say, this is a place where a woman will stand alone at night and be safe. 
This is where a man will stand alone at night and be at peace, that he's not going to be robbed. This is a place where a suicide will have second thoughts about taking their life, mm -hmm. and they will look elsewhere for help. He would add what we call magic to the bricks and mortar of the very building mm -hmm. they were standing in. But all these examples you give are <coughs> proactive in the sense that someone wants to do something. Now, there's the other side of the whole story, which, is, which we could, could call um, a mystic, who says, I am what I am, and I'll, the, the universal energy, God, whatever, will make himself known, and it's up to me to receive and not to act. This is not really part of witchcraft philosophy. It's an active religion. It does not mean yeah, to say that see. we respect the mystic. We do respect the mystic, but our mystics need to be a part of humanity. It's vitally important. We are a global village. We cannot sit on high mountains and contemplate life, the universe, and everything else. So how do I we see? We allow God, um, call it what you will, um, the gigantic DNA of the universe, to be part of us to share with the human race, mm -hmm. which cannot be detached from the human race. Um, witchcraft was the, the relig religion, as we used to say, of even where the word comes from, Wicca, it means to, to bend, to twist, um, to twist your thoughts and your understanding and to learn wisdom. To learn that kind of wisdom means that you have to be part of humanity. You may not detach yourself. Okay. Um, we are brothers Crow and sisters of the world. Yes, but Alastair Crowley said, do as thou willst is the whole of the law. And the way I understand it, it ah, means do. That's only half of his yes. statement. But it's an active... Love is the law, love and the will. Um, Alistair Crowley was not a witch, but he was a magician. When he said, do what thou will should be the whole of the law, what he meant was, whatever is inside you, do it. But do it with love, because that is the law. Your will must dictate what love is. And love is something that has to be learnt and cherished. The two statements are often split in the middle. Uh -huh. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. No, it was do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love and the will. Your ability to love and care and feel for the human mm -hmm. race. Crowley experimented with many drugs during his lifetime. He was, and I think this is part of the reason. If you could have brought Alistair Crowley to the 1960s, mm -hmm. he could have learnt from people like Timothy Leary and he would have been accepted. And Crowley would have come out the other side even a more amazing man than he was. Many people see Crowley, he liked to call himself the most wicked man on earth. If he had lived in the 60s, the hippies of the 60s would have said, Alistair, you're not wicked. You're pulling our leg. You're, you're, you're being trickster. very silly with it. You're a trickster. He was a great mountaineer. He was a magnificent poet. As a human being, he was an incredibly lonely, unhappy man. But mentally, he was a genius. His last words were basically, I don't understand. He had been so complicated all his life. Just before he died, he realized the answer was so simple. That all the very things he had written about, and that simple mm. statement of love being the law, love under will, hit him. And he suddenly realized, in a sense, he was a man born out of his time. And I don't know. Tim, Tim Leary, when he died, he said, why? And then he answered himself, he said, why not? <laughs> the same quintessential question, you know, why? Why all this suffering? Why action? Why passiveness? Because that's what we're talking about is, is, is magic versus mysticism, is about receiving and acting. And we both know that both are essential. Um, we always say nature is red in tooth and claw. Uh, it's no good being a witch unless you realize that uh, Mother Earth, the planet we live on, is a bitch. Uh, you walk into a field and you watch a fox hunt a rabbit, um, a cat playing with a mouse. The process can be very cruel. The law of nature is that you are born and you will eventually leave your physical body and die, whether you believe there is an afterlife or not. To try to run away and pretend that out there it's all 
butterflies and sweetness and flowers, as the 60s children did, the children of the, the hippie period, is an illusion. Magic is when you take away the mask of illusion. You cannot help everybody. And when I say that we are a healing religion, we are. But sometimes that process of healing is cruel. You have to be cruel to be kind sometimes. You have to sometimes turn to a person and say, I will not be your crutch. I will not let you cry on my shoulder and weep on me any longer. You have brought your suffering on yourself. Learn from it. Stand on your own two feet and face what you are. And sometimes it is what you want to be. Sometimes you will never throw away your crutch. You will always want to lean on the person beside you. This is where the old concept of a vampire comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it also makes me ask, are there happy witches then? Oh, yes. Is most of the witches I know, most of the witches I know in my own country, and certainly most, I mean, I've only just got to know these people in the Netherlands, um, certainly most of the ones I know in America, because Stuart and myself travel America um, every year. 90% of them are in the happy range, 50% of them are in the very happy range, and 20% are supremely happy. And it's not governed by the money you have in your pocket, the house you live in, or the lifestyle you live. It's contentment within yourself. But does that come from the power they have, or at least they think they have, over the external world? Um, the power that we have is around us in the air. It's the, the very atmosphere yeah, we breathe. Yeah, but most people can't harness it. They can think about money. They, can they think do about harness it all the time. They just don't know they harness it. Uh, okay, but... Um, one, uh, one psychiatrist many years ago discovered if he wished ill luck upon his friends, he could make them physically ill. He could bring them down with something as simple as the common cold. And then he would have to retract his feelings towards them because he would feel guilty about what had happened. Um, we affect each other all the day. If I was to turn to a person, one of the witches here today, and say, you know that man who runs that place who did the interview? Isn't he a bastard? I hope he has hell break loose on him. I would say that and ill wish you. Mm -hmm. Other people might listen to me and think, oh, what is she talking about? And they would ill wish you too. And something might or might not happen to you. If I wanted it hard enough and amplified it with their feelings, yes, things would happen to you. But if you were strong enough inside yourself, it would be no more than a fly landing upon your nose. Mm -hmm. And you could swat it away like that. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing is it could work the other way. I could say it as a joke about you. He's a bastard. You know, um, he's a lovely man. But, oh, he's a bastard, which would be a term of affection. And they would pick up on it, and their affection would come towards you and amplify my joke. And you would suddenly feel that other people around you were saying, he's a naughty person, he's fun. You can have a joke with him, a sense of humor with him. And they would react to you that way. Mm -hmm. Human emotion can be amplified to a person. This is where the idea of spells and magic come from. Um, Ill-wishing, putting curses on people. Well, well, that the was curse? a long time ago, <coughs> that was considered evil. Even by the law, if you ill-wished on someone, right. they, you know, could, they did yes. put you on the stakes or whatever. And then now we have a law that, well, the, the whole legal system says, well, you can think what you want, but if you don't kill anybody or whatever, that's fine. Um, until you do something. We can kill each other with kindness as well. Think about that sometimes. Yeah, but we have taken away this responsibility for our thought. This is one of the things that witchcraft teaches you, to have responsibility for your thought. And it is something that we are not the only philosophy on earth that believes this. But we feel very strongly that it doesn't mean to say you have to check yourself 24 hours a day. But if you suddenly find that, that you have spoken ill against somebody because they've upset you, you think, ah, no, 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 I don't do this. We, we don't do this. Um, I may not like him or her, but speaking ill of them is, is a very negative reaction. Uh, and you pull yourself back from that train of thought. You don't allow it to affect your everyday life. Um, one of our witches has a good, very good way of looking at it. He does not mean in the sense of killing a person, but if 
another member of the pagan community has stepped so badly out of line, not just once, but time and time and time again, as far as he is concerned, to him, they do not exist. He does not speak of them. He does not think about them, unless somebody comes and asks him a question. And then his attitude is, go find out for yourself. Um, I used to know him years ago, and we were friends for a while. I don't want to talk about our personal relationship. Um, just let's say we had a disagreement, but don't let me influence you against him. So for this, which personally, from. he abstains. It's an abst abstain ab abstaining from making a judgment on another human being. It does not mean to say that there aren't people in this world that we have a right to feel angry with. Um, I think, let's use a classic example. Um, if we look at the world as it stands today, if we look at the war-torn countries, if we look at politicians lying to each other, doing deeds behind each other's backs, we know it goes on. We're not stupid. None of us are stupid. We know that there is no such thing inside governments as complete truth and justice. Um, occasionally, a good man or woman comes along, and you look at them and you say, yes, this person is genuinely good. If we look at one of these personalities, and I would not even dream of mentioning one, let me use a dead one, let's use someone like Adolf Hitler. If we look at somebody like that, and we look, if we look at a Holocaust, we say, yes, this man committed a great sin by starting planting a seed. And from that seed, roots grew. And as those roots grew stronger, it became a diseased growth. A, a disease growth that wiped out many, many people and caused pain and grief to survivors. There is an evil there. But some of these people, like Hitler and like Jim Jones in America, uh, not in America, where was he? Um, South America. South uh, America, uh, that's Guana, it. Yeah. Guana. Guana, that's it. When you see a person like that with a charismatic personality who is able to influence people to such an extent they cannot think for themselves any longer, often fear uh, takes over and they get to a stage where their ability to think straight for themselves becomes corrupted. Out of that grows a great evil. It is where one person has been so charismatic they've been able to rob people of their own human desires, human personalities, and the right to survive, the right to make conscious decisions for themselves. They become like automatons. We are sheep. Let's all follow the leader. And then one day, the sheep say, no. They rebel. They pull back. But by that time, the Jim Joneses of this world have other sheep that close in on the herd and push them back together again. When they push them back together, even those that are able to think for themselves are too frightened to take a step forward and to say, I've had enough, and walk away. They're sometimes so frightened they've been robbed of every ounce of what we know as sanity, often every ounce of what we know as humanity. Mm -hmm. If they do survive and come out the other side, they come out casualties, casualties desperately needing help. Many of the... Uh, the, the, the American soldiers who went to Vietnam are still traumatized from their experiences, still trying to come out the other side, still trying to think for themselves. And what happens in a case like that? Take the American soldiers who went to Vietnam. When they come back and they reach out for help, they are denied it. They are cut off, not just from their root source, but from their culture who leaves them empty inside. They've taken all their energy, their youth, their vibrance. They've taken it and they've sucked them, sucked it out of them, and they've left an emptiness. And when they come back, nobody's filled the emptiness up. There's just a gap, a hollowness. Mm -hmm. It's like taking your spirit away and not giving you back your dignity, your spirit, your soul. Nothing inside you. 
Witchcraft as a philosophy is growing very fast. Many of the people who have come into witchcraft are casualties. Cat casualties from war situations such as Vietnam, casualties from society. Mm -hmm. One of the first processes that a modern witch coven tries to do is to give them back their self-respect. We say, yes, nature is red in tooth and claw. We can only help you so far. You must learn to help yourself, but you must learn to survive again. And to survive, the first law is find yourself once more and learn to forgive yourself because we can forgive you. I know one American witch who was in Vietnam and in one village, he was guilty of the murder of children, of rape, and of having sexual intercourse with a woman he had just killed. Um, he is shell-shocked. Now, even now, he is shell-shocked. He said, I came back from Vietnam and I felt lower than the lowest life form that I commit, committed these terrible crimes. He said, but the thing was, he said, I didn't know if those children were carrying grenades. All I saw were these little yellow things coming at me and knowing that it might be my life or their life. Survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and claw. He said, my anger, my aggression. The woman he killed, he knew was a member of the Viet Cong. Um, he discovered that, yes, she was willing to die to kill him. And all he wanted to do was hurt her so violently, even after he had killed her. And then he said, but I looked at her, and she was a child. She wasn't even yet an adult woman. She was still a child. He said, it could have been my own sister. He said, I got up, and I vomited violently. And I thought, how could I be so despicable? But the other side of him was saying, yes, yes, yes. And fighting this inside himself. At that time, he was not a witch. It wasn't until 15 years, 10 to 15 years later, that he began to discover paganism, witchcraft, etc. Um, every church he went to, into, and he'd been a good Christian, he said, I'm not anti Christian. He said, But I looked into the face of the statue of Christ and I thought, You're accusing me. I looked into the Madonna's face and I thought, You're accusing me. He said, Everywhere I went, it was like every door to my life had been shut, every spiritual door. Then he found some witches. He didn't understand their philosophy, but he got to know them. And then he realized that God had many faces and that God was very forgiving if you would learn to forgive yourself. And he became like a child again. He became dependent on the coven. Um, he was like a little boy going home to his parents. Uh, he would cry. Um, sometimes he would get very violently ill because of all the trauma inside himself. He said, I didn't want to show my parents, my natural parents, what I was feeling because they were elderly and it would have been too distressing for them. So he adopted the high priest and high priestess as alternative parents. It was the high priest and high priestess who sat up sometimes all night with him while he cried, mm -hmm. he rocked, he screamed out of his system the pain and the anguish he'd been through. Um, sometimes it was so much, as I said, he became violently, physically sick. And it was the high priestess who would hold his head over the toilet basin while he vomited, clean him up, put him to bed, feed him the next morning, cook him breakfast. And gradually they taught him how to forgive his soul for what he'd done. It took him a long time. He came out of the other side of the experience. There are still noises that frighten him. They make him jump, loud bangs, for example. But he took his experience and he now works as a counselor for other people that have come from Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, other soldiers. At one time, he could not look a Vietnamese woman in the face. Now he can. And he ended up happily married to a Vietnamese woman. Mm -hmm. It's as if, as he said, it's as if divinity, God, call it what you will, had said, you learned a terrible lesson 
when you were no more than basically a young man yourself. He was only about 18 years old. Um, it's as if God said, here, come back. You're forgiven. Mm -hmm. And gave him a Vietnamese bride. <laughs> and that's, that is something that witches would call magic. When a human being is capable of healing themselves and when they are given something that is not a compensation, but a way of saying you understand. Now, many psychologists would say he was drawn to a Vietnamese bride because of what he did to a Vietnamese woman. This actually was not true. Um, this Vietnamese lady nearly ran, uh, ran him over in her car. She got out of the car to apologize to him. He, his first reaction was to pull back. <laughs> And then they started talking, and they discovered they both were studying the same subject because she took him, she put him in the car because um, he was pretty badly bruised. She took him back to his house, and he was very polite and invited her in for a cup of coffee, and they got talking. Mm -hmm. Within a week, they started dating, and two weeks later, they both realized they were passionately in love with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so it was not that he was looking okay, for but compensation. Now, now, uh, you could call this synchronicity as you... It is, it is synchronicity. Yeah. Okay. A lot of magic is synchronicity. Yes, but let's get back to the basic questions here. Do you believe in evil? Do you believe no. in evil outside of yourself? Do you believe in evil inside I yourself? I do not believe in evil full stop. Um, let's and, take and it yet, outside and humanity. Yet the rituals deal with, let's say, at least forces that have... A black and a, and a white side. No, there's no such thing as black and white. There is positive and negative. Um, I do not believe that pure evil as such exists. Imbalance exists, but not evil. But is imbalance not a state that will lead to movement, that will lead to a new balance and, and a new imbalance? Um, now, let us take the crime, the rising crime rate in the world. How much of that is from the breakdown of understanding, communication, and the family unit? A lot of it is. And how much of that was caused by people who, like, um, just we were, we were talking about crime rates with someone, and I said, you know, in, after, the f after the Second World War, people said, we will not have this again. We will ban insecurity, so we will have a pension for everybody, mm -hmm. our way, as we call it. And we had what we call the welfare state. And for 50 years we had a welfare state, and now it's been taken down rather vigorously. And now people at the same time say, yes, but... We are talking of two things here. We are talking of a rat race. Survival of the fittest. Flight or fright. Survival is that desperate need. Stay alive, stay alive. Grab, take, grab, take, grab, take. It's not evil, it's blinkered vision. Mm -hmm. Take someone, uh, yes, take somebody like Charlie Manson, the American mass murderer. Oh, you have to just 39 people either kill themselves or were killed or whatever with something. They killed themselves. Um, that's, they had a divine belief in something. That's, that's not evil, that's stupidity. Um, but take somebody like Charlie Manson. Charlie Manson, one of these dynamic, vibrant people, creates a little group around him and they go out and they commit mass murder in America. I would love to see an autopsy report after his death on Charlie Manson's brain. Often I believe that evil comes within human beings, not from some force out there, but from a mixture of genetic and uh, conditioning during childhood. Um, yeah, but there is, is no doubt evil? that certain chromosomes produce criminal tendencies. Mm -hmm. Is a chromosome evil? Of course it's not. It's a freak of nature. And therefore, what we're talking about is an imbalance inside nature. Yeah, but if, if, if Charles Manson would have lived in uh, Papua New Guinea, where small well, families would go out and, and kill each other and eat each they'd other... They'd probably have killed him. Yeah, probably, but he would have been a hero of his... Folks. Oh, yes, probably. Yes. So it's all a matter... So was Genghis Khan. He was a hero of his folks. Um, I think the problem you have to understand is it is very easy to say a man is evil or a woman is evil. No, it's not the personality. It is the lack of people around that personality to realise 
that they are often mentally so disturbed that it gives them the ability to create what we know as evil around them. Mm -hmm. It is the dynamic inside them that influences people. I'm afraid that a lot of humanity are sheep. We all run along behind each other, trying to catch up with each other. We all want to belong to something. When oh, well, you get is, a dynamic is, along yeah. who goes, I can control you. You know, there's a good, there's a good story about it. Uh, Ra Uruhu told me. He said, you know, in the old days, there were a lot of herding animals, herd, herd animals, sheep and whatever. We took them away. Where did the souls of the, of the um, whatever, of the, uh, the sheep go? They turn into people. If there's a, a finite amount of souls, then you take away the animals and we become... Um, <laughs> we become the sheep. Yes. Um, it, it's again, as I say, nature is red in tooth and claw. If you watch the behavior of an animal in the wild, it's interesting that at one time we had no concept that the chimpanzee was capable of murder, but it is. Now we've when also realized the gentle no dolphin. Everyone thought, oh, dolphins, aren't they beautiful? Um, yes, the cestations of the, t the sea are very much in communication with us in the sense that they are our cousins. Um, there is much we can learn from them. But it's now been discovered that even dolphins are capable of murder. And can you call a dolphin evil because it has murdered another dolphin? We don't see that concept with them. Evil is a term we have invented in ourselves. Now, that does not excuse mm -hmm. the Holocaust. It does not excuse a man like Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust. But, but it, it does has say, gone. if we stand back and look at what caused that Holocaust, then okay, we could put evil upon that situation and one man's ability to manipulate. But as we were taught when we were children, uh, certainly in Christian countries, our original conditioning was that there will be a day of judgment, and on the day we die, you stand before the throne of God, etc., and you have to basically justify your actions. Well, say you take somebody who's been a very, as we say, evil person in their life, and you use that idea of a Christian concept, and they come before the throne of God. And the human race says, evil, 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 and God said, no, excuse me, that person had a brain tumor, which was undetected, pushing on a certain part of the brain. The tumor was the cause of an evil, not the soul of the human. What are you doing? How dare you judge yeah, but then this you, person? You, you come to a, a general system of determinism and say, whatever I do, I do because I have to do it, and away with free Maybe. will. Maybe. No, no, no. Free will is there. But sometimes free will is taken from us because of disease. If you like, disease is an evil. If you must use the word evil, disease is an evil. Um, but it happened in your life, too. You're a witch, but you're married to a steward. He developed some kind of cancer, some kind of growth. And he had a, a brain hemorrhage, um, but not to the extent that it turned him into a violent, aggressive man. No, but didn't you feel like most people in a, in a situation like that, rebelling against the gods or the system? No, or no, no, I did not. And that was for one particular reason is that Stuart, I'm 46 and Stuart is 80. He was 79 when this happened. And therefore, everyone's life has to one day come to an end. And this was the beginning of a process. It was a natural process. If he had been my age, it would not have been the gods, God, call it what you will, that I would have been angry with. I would have been angry that I might lose the man I loved because of disease and because of what was happening to him. But I would not say that that was the will of God that this should happen. It is a natural process. Nature decrees yeah, 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 yeah. by That's natural process. That's true, processes. but most people still, if you die when you're 79 or 105, most people feel this as evil, as bad, as you know, they don't like it. Are None you of telling us want to die. No, no, that's But when fine. it comes to another member of the family, the only reason we feel this is our own insecurity. Okay, but is this what witchcraft taught you? That the, the, the door to this other thing, this past life, or in any way, the, the end of life is easier to swallow? 
Yes. Did it make, made it you easier for you? It made it much easier for me to swallow. I, I had grown up as a Christian, and witchcraft taught me a lot, even about Christianity, um, to the extent that uh, I feel that the, the teachings I had as a, as a child, as a Christian, have been amplified now and made a thousand times better. Um, it's made me into a stronger, less vulnerable human being um, for myself personally. It means I am able personally to face my own diseases. It is possible at the moment I have cancer. I won't know until a few weeks' time whether I have or have not. If I have, then it is something I will fight with personally myself. If I survive, then fair play. If I don't, that's not such a big deal. I'm not so frightened about it. Um, it makes it much easier to understand the processes of life and death. None of us have any real proof, so what's except the spiritually, difference? of an afterlife. None of us have any real proof. But it makes that proof more believable, more tangible. It does not give it a, a, us total proof, but enough for us to know, if you like, in our souls that there is beyond. Whether it is reincarnation, whether it's even genetic reincarnation through our gene pool. Mm -hmm. The important thing is living here and now and everything around you that you see and experience to which is always a sense of wonder. It's as if from the day you are born to the day you die, you must never lose that sense of wonder. You must always have that essential okay. divine child inside you, which turns into an adult that can still understand the child and use it practically. Um, that's why I teach my witches to be silly sometimes, mm -hmm. to remember what it's like to be children. Yeah, but um, you, you say that, and I've been talking with um, Ramdas, who says, be here now, Leary before he died, they all had that same message. Yes. Be here now. And, yes, that's and important. It, to me, it feels that on the, on the most core level, witchcraft is not different from, well, you know, deep Hinduism or Christianity. It, it's on the deep not, core, it's all... It's not. Even with uh, Christianity, um, a true Christian who understands their faith and is happy with it, accepts the philosophy of an afterlife, but it's between the day they are born and the day they die as to what they make of that life. To hope and want for the future, in other words, to want death, was not what Jesus wanted. He wanted you to live for today, to work with your neighbor 